So today we're going to be talking about the foundation of the Roman Republic. We'll begin by looking at the situation in Latium at the time of the transition, um, how this larger context might have facilitated Rome's decision to go from a monarchy to a republic. And then look at, the overview, look at an overview of the basic components of government in the Roman Republic and how it's different from the monarchy. And then finally, take a closer look at the first consuls of Rome, Brutus, first Collatinus, and then Publius Valerius, and talk a little bit about what happens to Collatinus and why. So 509 BC, this is an incredibly significant year in the history of Rome. This is the year when they change from a monarchy to a republic, or when it's traditionally dated. Um, it's very likely, as we'll talk about in a, in a bit, that this transition happened over a longer period of time, was a bit rocky, but historians, when they look back at the history of Rome, date the transition from monarchy to republic to 509 BC. And it's tied in particular to the expulsion of Tarquin the Proud and his family. Um, Tarquin the Proud is the father of Sextus, Tarquin, who is the rapist of Lucretia, and we will be talking about um, the rape of Lucretia, looking closely at that in class. So you'll get a sense of all of the different components involved in the decision um, to expel the Tarquins and um, all of their relatives from Rome, and consequently to transition from a monarchy to a republic. What's somewhat lost to us is exactly why this happens. It's traditionally assigned to the fact that um, Tarquin the Proud was a bad king. He was a tyrant, and he's cast in the role of a tyrant by Livy and by other historians of early Rome. But it's just as likely that what we actually had was a move by a group of elites who felt sort of that they weren't getting as much power under a monarchy as they would have liked, and so they decide that they want to seize power, um, that they're in fact going to transition to a kind of shared governance where different elite families dole out different responsibilities, but all of them get to have a piece of the cake, as it were, rather than just a single family. Um, it may be also just connected to that, a growing dislike of the monarchy, that they're starting to see the downsides of monarchy when it's abused by somebody um, like Tarquin the Proud. But again, it's, it's difficult to know exactly sort of how bad Tarquin and his, his son really were. Um, it's also a period, this, this end of the sixth century, beginning of the fifth century, is a period of extreme political turbulence in Latium. So the fact that this is also the time when Rome itself is experiencing political, political turbulence isn't all that surprising. It's a time where lots of cities are going through transitions, and so Rome may have just been sort of part of a larger trend. Some facts about Latium in the 6th century, so in the period, in the century that leads up to the transition from monarchy to republic. Um, Latium is a collection of politically independent cities. They share similarities of language. Um, all of them are speaking various dialects of Latin. So unlike in Etruria, where they're speaking essentially dialects of Greek, and in Campania as well, where they're speaking Greek or dialects of Greek, in um, Latium, we have the beginnings of Latin. We have a different language happening. Um, and all of these different cities are, are speaking some dialect that is similar. And then clearly, they can, they can talk to one another. They, their languages are similar enough that they can interact, um, whether it's for trade or for um, social gatherings. There's similarities in culture. Um, the archaeology of Latium in the 6th century shows us this. We see similarities in pottery styles and in building styles that suggest that there's some sort of, of mutual exchange going on among these different cities. We know that they came together for festivals, that there were, were festivals that all cities in Latium would join together and celebrate. And in fact, um, this is what we saw with the, the rape of the Sabine women, that this happened at a time of a festival. and, and the, the gathering of all of the cities was used as a, as a way to lure women 
um, to Rome. These different towns shared the right of intermarriage. So, you know, if you were from Rome, you were allowed to marry a Sabine or you were allowed to marry a Volscian or whoever. Um, it was, there, there was a legal right to marry people outside of your city. You could own land in other cities, so you had the right of ownership. Um, you had the right of legal contracts. You could make contracts that were enforceable with citizens in other cities. And you had the right of citizenship. So if another city wanted to give you citizenship, that was possible. Um, so there were, in fact, you know, lots of evidence for um, some, some mutual exchange among these different cities. But it's important to keep in mind that they were not, this, these were not tight bonds. These cities operated largely independently. And there's been a tendency among historians to talk about the cities of Latium as a, a kind of Latin League. Um, so there's, there's been this sort of invention of the term Latin League as to talk about an alliance that these cities may or may not have made. Certainly at different times, they did enter into um, both uh, particularly military alliances. And we know that at the end of the sixth century, when Rome and other cities in Latium were being attacked by hill tribes, um, particularly the Sabines and the Volscians, that other cities in the, the Latin League bound together, joined forces to defend mutually the different cities from these, these raids. Um, these were not formal military engagements, really they were raids um, on cities. But you, know, you can see that even in the, in the late 6th, early 5th century, these cities didn't have elaborate military defenses. There wasn't a standing army. Um, there weren't really de border. There weren't ways to defend the borders of the cities. And so, you know, we're only now sort of starting to enter a period where cities are deciding that they they need to to figure out how to how to have a an, a, an effective defense system. Um, but what we know about Latium in the sixth century is pretty fragmentary. Um, clearly, there's exchange among the different cities, but it's important to keep in mind that they, were, they operated largely independently, and that when they did come together, it was, seems to have been for reasons of celebrating festivals and deities in common, so various Italic deities in particular, or because they had they, a common military threat that they were trying to um, fend off. So when Livy's talking about the transition from monarchy to republic, um, he talks about it in terms of sort of in the early republic, you have the rule by select aristocratic families. Um, so in essence, an oligarchy. And the model of an oligarchy had existed throughout Italy all the way back to the archaic period. This is nothing new. Um, the city of Rome is not inventing anything, but rather it's like many cities since the archaic period, deciding to transition from one form that is monarchy or rule of one to the rule of the few. Um, and in the early Republic, what we clearly have is a number of aristocratic families, um, probably descended from these original patricians, seizing power. Um, a couple of differences from the monarchy, they how, when they held offices, they were annual. So they weren't forever. They weren't for five years. They weren't for four years. They were yearly. And they were elected, um, ideally. Now, we'll talk some about exactly what these elections looked like in some later lectures. And it's not quite that everybody had a vote, but at least there was some input, um, ostensibly, from the masses. And then finally, they practice what's called collegial rule. And what this means is that nobody held an office by themselves. There were always two of them. So, you know, when we talk about consuls, there's never one, just one consul for a long period of time, ideally. There's always two, and they balance each other off. So it is a way of preventing one person from seizing an unlawful amount of power. When Livy's contrasting the monarchy and the republic, as he does in the reading that you did, he talks about the two forms of government in terms of monarchy as the caprice of individual men. Um, and what he means by that is just sort of the whims of the king. 
the king can do whatever he wants. And so there's not sort of any sense of consistency. It's just whatever the king wants to do. If the king is good, then everything's great. If the king is a tyrant, like Tarquin the Proud, well, things aren't so great. And then the Republic he describes as the authority of law. And what he means by that then is we're not talking anymore about people and the governance is no longer dependent on individuals. It's outside of that now and it's grounded in a legal system. And exactly what this legal system looked like is another question. But at least for Livy writing 700 years after the foundation of the Republic, almost 800 years after the foundation of the Republic, um, for Livy, he draws this very strong contrast between the monarchy as being about individual will and the republic as being about law. He also highlights the role of liberty, um, and this, this will come up again when we talk about Brutus, but for Livy, libertas or liberty is central. Um, and it's it's the hallmark of Repu of the republic, and this is something that will continue all the way into the late republic and even into the early empire. Um, this the celebration of liberty as a central, almost Roman right, and it means a lot of different things, but uh, can be translated as something along the lines of free will, free speech, the ability to speak against power without fear of punishment. And liberty is really the opposite in the Roman mentality. It's the opposite of tyranny. Um, so it's what is an antidote to tyranny, really. And so it's the perfect sort of, um, when you're talking about uh, the last Tarquin, Tarquin the Proud, the antidote to his tyranny now is the liberty that Brutus brings um, to Rome, Brutus as the first consul. Livy makes the point, and it's an interesting point and worth thinking about, um, but he makes the point that early Rome actually required a monarchy, that it was so out of control, just a bunch of hoodlums, lawless, really immature. He, he talks about it almost in terms of, of life stages and says, you know, early Rome was like a child um, that really just, it needed that kind of absolute control. It, would, it wouldn't have worked otherwise. But, says, now that we've gotten into the end of the 6th century, um, early 5th century, it no longer needs that kind of, it's a, it's a teenager about to go off to college. It doesn't need that kind of control anymore. So now that it's politically mature, um, its citizenry can manage the rights and responsibilities of the republic. Um, and so he really describes the republic as kind of reaching maturity. Um, that individuals now are able to take responsibility for themselves. They don't need somebody telling them what to do anymore. Livy presents this transition from monarchy to republic in pretty smooth terms. The reality is it was certainly more rocky. Um, we know that much for sure. But exactly how rocky it was, what a Roman thought that was living in this period is, is not always clear to us. But one thing that I think we can speculate about and, and speculate with some certainty is that when Brutus and, and his allies overthrow the Tarquins and send them into exile, it probably wasn't all that clear to the rest of the Romans that this was the end of the monarchy. And in many ways, they were probably waiting around for another king. Um, it wasn't clear that this was it. We were entering the beginnings of a very long period that would be the Republic. Um, and it's important to keep that in mind that certainly from retrospect, and Livy is writing from retrospect, yes, it was clear that, that you know, we have the end, with the overthrow of um, the Tarquins, we have the beginnings of the Republic. But that wouldn't have been at all clear that, you know, 507 was it. Um, to somebody actually living in 507. So now we're going to turn to what did the form of governance look like in the Republic? Who, who did stuff? Um, how did stuff get done when you don't have a king? Elites, not unexpectedly, seized control and they performed all of the duties controlled by the monarch, um, distributed amongst themselves. 
As we said, though, the offices that are created, these, these magistries, um, and the people holding them are called magistrates, but these offices were held by people who ostensibly at least were elected. Um, they held them only for a year, and they held them in tandem with someone else. So they could never sort of exert absolute authority. And that, that issue, that idea of collegiality was really essential um, to Republican governance. Prior to about 400 BC, when the consulship becomes fixed and you have an annual consulship, two people are elected and hold office at the same time, but prior to that period, so from about 507 to 400, where things are still kind of in that transition phase, it looks like the Republic was basically governed by military tribunes. Um, and the size of the group of tribunes that governed it varied, it, and it just depended on the particular time. Um, it could be as few as three or four, and in later periods it was as many as six. But you essentially had, sort of in the place of the consulship, these military tribunes, and, and at times, um, between 507 and 400, you also had um, um, consuls holding office. But, you know, what we have in, in this transitional period is more of a kind of military state, if you will. Um, and partly this just shows us the extent to which, during this period, Rome is, is needing to defend itself. Um, and that it's, it's not quite as settled um, as it will eventually become. And just to give you a sense of some of the different offices, here we have actually um, an example of a tribune. Um, and we'll talk in later lectures about some of the different offices, but um, this is one of the most famous tribunes, and he's actually a tribune of the people, of the plebs, Gaius Gracchus. Um, but there were lots of different offices that people could hold other than the consulship. The consulship was the most powerful, but there were lots of people had to look out to make sure the sewers were working properly, to make sure the roads were maintained, that the budget was balanced, all of those kinds of activities. One office that we see showing up from time to time in the Republic, and eventually quite a lot in the late Republic, is the dictatorship. Um, and the dictatorship in its origins is something that is used in an emergency, um, in a time of war when Rome is under attack and when it needs to have central decision making. So you can imagine that having this collegial rule and even when you had groups of, of military tribunes ruling, that group decisions are often, if not always, better than single decisions. This is well documented in, in various studies, even in, in the modern period. But they take more time. And when you're in a situation where you don't have time to sort of argue the pros and cons of different possible decisions, but you just need to make some decisions and make sure that your city is not sacked, then a dictator might be helpful. But you want to make sure that this dictator doesn't sort of set himself up as king. And so in the Republic, there were a number of different rules sort of limiting and governing the dictator's powers. Um, very interestingly, they were actually put into office, they were sworn into office in a ceremony that had to take place at midnight, sort of signifying the extent to which this is not meant to be sort of the usual form of governance. Um, but it was, a, it was an exceptional um, time, and it was a time of, of dire emergency. The dictator was then expected to appoint essentially a, a vice president, a second in command, who held the title of Master of the Calvary, or Magister Equitum. And this Master of the Calvary was supposed to keep the dictator in check. He didn't have equal powers, but he was supposed to sort of serve as an advisor. Um, dictators were given terms of six months, or however long the emergency lasted. So if the emergency lasted for fewer than six months, then they were expected to lay down their powers. Um, and they could be reappointed for additional terms if necessary. And it's this reappointment issue that actually comes up when we're talking in the late Republic, um, in particular about Julius Caesar, who makes himself dictator for life. Um, and this is how he manages to eliminate the consulship. 
is just seize the the powers of the dictator and make sure that he's always dictator. Um, as we'll we'll find out, the Roman people aren't so happy about this. So now looking at the first consuls of Rome. Um, so this is an image of Brutus. Um, this is a bronze portrait of Brutus, famous. We'll be talking a lot more about Brutus in class, um, but. Uh, Brutus is given credit basically for bringing Rome from monarchy to republic and sort of for as a reward for his his efforts he is one of the people elected as consul when in sort of the mythology of Rome they immediately transition from the monarchy to the the republic there are always at least two consuls um, they have the full powers of the king between them but a one-year term. And it's sort of in an interesting um, aside, it's always just one consul who holds um, what are called the fosces, but these are the, the rods, the military rods that give him um, military power. And these were what the king had, and it's what sort of was symbol symbolic of the king's power. When the consuls have them, they switch off who has them, but it's always only one of them at a time. Um, and there, it's always collegial, so, um, or it's meant to always be collegial. During the, in the first set of consuls, um, we have Brutus, and then we have Tarquinius Colatinus is his co-consul. And Livy tells us an interesting story about Tarquinius Colatinus. Um, as you might gather from his name, he is related to the Tarquins. He's one of the Tarquins, um, as is, in fact, Brutus himself although he sort of hides that fact. But, you know, clearly the Tarquins in some sense are still in power. But what we have sort of, at least in part in this transition to Republic is a kind of um, clan battle for, for power. It's, it's like, again, sort of, you know, you know, the mafia doing battle within the family for who's going to be the head. Um, and that's in some sense what we have with um, the exile of some of the Tarquins, but Brutus, who is, is related to them, being elected as consul, and the second consul, another Tarquin, Colatinus. Well, Brutus manages to convince the masses. Um, he gives an, an eloquent speech saying that Colatinus should just take himself into exile, and that he'll be allowed to keep his possessions but that he should recognize that the Romans just want nothing to do with the Tarquins after their horrible experiences with the tyrant um, Tarquinius Superbus, um, Tarquin the Proud. Um, and this, this speech is effective. Um, Colatinus really you know, just gets slammed and realizes that his power, his authority, has been entirely undermined by Brutus. Um, and it's, it's an interesting move by Brutus to kind of seize power even within this collegial relationship. Um, and so Colatinus takes himself off into exile with the rest of the Tarquins, and in his place, Publius Valerius is elected, not nearly as, as powerful or visible as, as Colatinus was, and this gives Brutus the upper hand. Um, as consul, Brutus added equestrians to the Senate in order to bring the total to 300. Um, so the equestrians are people that can buy a horse, basically, they own a horse. And eventually this will become a, a named social class um, in Rome, and it's just below the nobility. Um, so, um, but the equestrians are able to, are now joining the Senate. So we've g gone down, we started off with 100. That gradually had decreased in part because of um, Tarquin the Proud killing off a number of senators that he viewed as rivals. Um, and so now we've, we've enriched the Senate um, and increased it. And this will be an, a sort of ongoing issue of sort of what the relationship is between the consuls and the Senate um, in terms of, of Roman governance. <clears throat> 